So this is the missing section of my Practical Astronomy Show talk that I ran out of time to give. In particular, in this section of the talk, I shall be explaining how to choose the correct gain to use when deep sky imaging with your CMOS camera. <clears throat> so before we ran out of time, we'd busted the myth that you can always improve your image quality by taking longer sub-exposures. And we actually showed that the optimum sub-exposure length is given by this formula, 10 R squared upon P, where R is the read noise of your camera in electrons and P is your light pollution rate in electrons per pixel per second. We'd also looked at some typical light pollution rates for different types of sky from an inner city sky through to an excellent dark site and different uh, scope focal ratios. Using our formula, we could then convert these light pollution rates into recommended sub-exposure times. And we came up with two sets of sub-exposure times, one for a typical CMOS type camera where we assumed a 2.5 electron read noise, and one for a typical CCD light camera where we assumed a seven electron read noise. And just as a reminder, we showed that if we go beyond the recommended sub-exposure length, you really only get incredibly tiny improvements in final image quality when you stack all the frames that you take. So let's talk about gain now. Changing the gain isn't something that CCD images have to worry about because most CCD sensors don't have a gain control to adjust. But CMOS images do have to think about what gain to use when they're imaging because changing the gain on a CMOS camera uh, affects some of the characteristics of that camera. In particular, when you increase the gain on a CMOS camera, it reduces the read noise. Typically, when you start off increasing the gain from minimum gain values, the reduction in read noise is quite rapid and then it tails off as the gain, the rate of reduction tails off as the gain rises. Now we already know that the read noise strongly affects the recommended sub-exposure length and as the read noise is reduced the recommended sub-exposure length will drop away. Not only that, increasing the gain reduces the full well depth of the sensor, that is the number of electrons that are required to take each pixel to its saturation or completely white level. This actually means that the maximum exposure length you can take for a particular situation drops as you increase the gain because eventually the amount of brightness from the light pollution would saturate the whole image to white at a high enough gain and long enough exposures. We also need to be quite clear about what increasing gain doesn't change. So increasing gain doesn't change the number of photons you collect during an imaging session. If you image M42 for an hour at gain 100, you collect exactly the same number of photons into your sensor as if you image it for an hour at gain 800. Now remember that as long as we stick to our recommended sub-exposure length formula, the quality of our final stacked image is determined by the number of photons that we collect and how long we image for in total, not the particular sub-exposure length or anything like the read noise of the camera. So changing the gain doesn't change the final stacked image noise, providing we stick to our sub-exposure formula. So let's quickly talk about unity gain and whether it's a good idea, because that's often discussed in the context of deep sky imaging. Unity gain is simply the gain value where adding one elect extra electron to the pixel by detecting one extra photon leads to an output change of one unit. This seems like a good idea in terms of making sure you measure the number of photons de detected in the most accurate way possible. But actually what you're forgetting about there is the fact that there's noise involved. There's read noise that we can't get away from and shot noise as well. In fact, if you look at the majority of commonly used CMOS sensors now, you find that the read noise at unity gain is typically two electrons or more, which means that by going to unity gain, you're not really measuring exactly the number of electrons that are being detected in each pixel because the noise gets in the way. All you're measuring is that noise in more detail than you would at lower gains. So in my opinion, this means that unity gain is actually just an irrelevant concept and it doesn't really help you during your imaging at all.
So what we've established so far is that the primary result of using a higher gain value is to allow you to take shorter sub exposures because of the reduced read noise associated with that higher gain value. What we need to do now is look a bit at the sort of gain charts that many camera manufacturers make available so that we can understand when this is advantageous to, it, to us and when it isn't. So a gain chart that you might see for a sensor might look a bit like this. There are two lines on this chart. The important one that we're going to look at is the read noise in orange, which drops from about three and a third electrons at minimum gain through down to quickly down to two and then just under one and a half electrons. What you can notice from this chart is that the steepest part of the drop is at the lowest gain values and by the higher gain values that curve's definitely beginning to flatten out. Uh, now a different type of sensor also exists where there's sometimes a step change in the read noise at a particular gain value and in these types of sensor the um, internal electronics of the sensor is switching from one mode to another at that particular value and can often give you a much better read noise uh, once you move above that value. So here we can see the read noise starts at about three electrons makes its way gradually down to two and a half and then drops to only just over one and a half as the camera changes mode from what's called low, low conversion gain to high conversion gain. And then there is a very much more gradual reduction in read noise uh, as the gain moves up to higher and higher values. Now what's interesting is that the sub-exposure length that we can take is proportional to the read noise squared. So while the read noise is reducing, we can take shorter and shorter sub-exposures. But once we get to the area of gain above about a thousand in this particular case, where there's really no more reduction in read noise going on, there's no further advantage to us in moving to higher gain values. In fact, we can see that when we plug the read noise figures from the last chart into our formula for calculating the optimum sub-exposure length. So the, our calculated sub-exposure length drops off quite rapidly as we initially reduce the gain, then drops off, off a cliff where the camera changes mode, and then really doesn't improve much more all the way up to the maximum gain of this camera, which is 10,000, or in this particular case, 100 times brighter than the minimum gain. So what does that mean for choosing a gain value? Well, first of all, we only want to increase the gain from a minimum value while the read noise graph value is getting smaller on the charts we just looked at. Once we approach the, set, uh, the area of the chart where the read noise is not changing very much anymore, there's really no need uh, or no value in increasing the gain any further. So a good reason to increase the gain from the minimum value would be in a situation where our mount hardware has difficulty in tracking correctly for the sub-exposure lengths recommended for minimum gain. Suppose we are using an out as mount in this situation we're looking at here and field rotation is going to become a problem if our exposures are greater than 20 seconds, then we would turn the gain up far enough to move into the lower read noise selection of the sensors operation from this point here to ensure we can take sub exposures that are less than 10 seconds and avoid the problem with field rotation. So the other aspect to consider when choosing a gain value is how the gain affects the dynamic range. The dynamic range of an image is the ratio between the brightest thing in the image that is not quite pure white and the dimmest thing that you can see above the noise level of the image. In general, you see the highest dynamic range in your final stacked image if you use minimum gain. As at minimum gain, each subframe has the maximum full well depth and therefore each subframe has a high dynamic range. As you use higher gains and shorter subframes, you do lose dynamic range in each subframe, but you do manage to take more subframes in the same period of time. So that gains you back some of the loss.
cameras like the one we've just looked at that have a, a switch between low and high conversion gain modes tend to show a secondary peak in the dynamic range like this graph here. So you can see that at minimum gain we have a dynamic range of about 14 stops but once we switch into the high conversion gain mode we actually pick up to a dynamic range of nearly 15 stops in our simulated one hour stack. So some recommendations on gain. Firstly, increase the gain from the minimum value to reduce the recommended sublength if you need to deal with mount tracking errors, field rotation, or anything like that. Basically, this is the way to ensure you don't need to upgrade your mount to an expensive one if you can just do so by changing your camera settings. There's no point in going into the part of the gain range where the read noise flattens out. Only stay, stay in that part of the range where you gain a reduction in read noise by increasing the gain. You can look at the graphs that your camera manufacturer produces and publishes to work out the parts of the gain range that are useful to you. Subject to being able to satisfy one and two above, typically using the minimum gain possible that works for part one, would then give you the maximum dynamic range. So don't go any higher than you need to go to satisfy your sub length constraints. However, if your camera shows a step reduction in read noise due to a change from low conversion gain to high conversion gain, the best gain to use may well be just above that step reduction.